right, open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy 1. If you don't have a traditional Bible and you're comfortable, just raise your hand. One of my friends will bring you one. You can either borrow that or you can keep it. It's our gift. You can also open up the YouVersion app or it's also called the Bible app and all the notes and scriptures have already been uploaded on there for you to follow along with. Of course, we'll also put them behind me on the screen just to make it as easy as possible. If you're watching us online or at one of our other gatherings, I love you and I'm so glad that you guys are part of our family. And I'm super glad you're part of our family in this heat wave. Like it is hot, it is so hot. I talked to some people yesterday who had just come back from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and they were like so excited that they were able to go somewhere that was warm and it was 10 degrees hotter here when they were here than when they were in Myrtle Beach. I talked about last week that we're always in a series of messages here and one of the types of series that we do is what you call exegetical series and that's where we take an extended period of time and we focus on one particular book of the Bible. And can I tell you that they are the least entertaining but they are the most educational because what I've come to understand is that I'm not looking to entertain people. I'm looking to educate people and I'm looking to get people to fall in love with this book that is the only thing that will sustain them because entertainment will not sustain you. We know that things that used to be entertaining now can be something that is offensive. The Cosby Show used to be the most entertaining show in the world when I was a kid. So this, this whole series is meant to give us a deeper knowledge a deeper understanding. And so we're gonna spend the next nine weeks talking about 83 verses, seven of which we're gonna talk about today. And I know that it's slow. I know that that's methodical. <laughs> but after close to 25 years of being trusted to stand behind pulpits, when it comes to speaking specifically about books of the Bible, this has become more than my style, it's become my strategy. And so I've come to the conclusion that this is what the scriptures deserve, that they deserve a thoroughness because I think the temptation in our fast-paced instant access instant gratification culture is to speed through to, to to skim over and pick out the parts that suit us in the situations that we find ourselves in at the moment but scripture was never meant to be skimmed it's always been meant to be mined so that the principles that we find within it will be more than just deposited for a quick withdrawal for the situations that we find ourselves in at the moment, but instead that it will be drilled deep down within us so that these words can be accessed, so that they could be harvested in the future for situations and challenges that we'll face in the future that we don't even know about today. So for the next nine weeks, we're going to look at, we're going to linger on 83 verses that the great apostle Paul wrote to his apprentice to his spiritual son, Timothy, starting today with a message we're calling Fan the Flame. Let's pray. God, we love you. We honor you. We're grateful to you. Thank you for who you are and what you've done, what you've done in the past, what you're doing now, and what you're going to do in the future. God, the greatest things that you've ever done in our lives haven't even been realized yet. The greatest move that you'll ever have in our spirits, in our churches, in our cities have haven't even been discovered yet. So today, we humble ourselves in your sight. You said if we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, you will lift us up. And so today, I pray that as we make ourselves small, that you would fill us with your spirit and your grace, your wisdom, your understanding. Make us less like us and more like you in Jesus' name. Amen. So over the course of the past few years, particularly doing, during the season that, that I was blessed with concentrated time afforded by a global pandemic and the shutdown that it caused, <laughs> I've grown to love not only the writings of the Apostle Paul, but the person of Apostle Paul, his past, his personality, his passion, his, his presence that he carried throughout the global climate of this first century world that he wrote his letters into and for. I've grown even more, if possible, to love biblical history, the content, the, the context. It, it makes the whole thing come alive. But, but I don't only love biblical history, I love church history. Church history lets us know that we're a part of something bigger. Uh, I think it's important for me as a pastor to periodically remind you where we fit into the flow of what God has done and what God will do. Because as Jesus people, we're living our lives between two spaces. Our entire lives 
are lived between two eternities, eternity past and eternity future. And by living in the in-between, it creates a dynamic. It creates a tension between God, what God has done in Jesus and, and what God is going to do in Jesus. As followers of Jesus, we're really called to be preachers, all of us. And in that call to be preachers, we are meant to preach a history, a, a biography, in a sense, of Jesus, who came from heaven, lived his life here on earth, performed miracles, presented teachings, died on the cross for the sins of humanity, rose again on the third day, and ascended back to heaven. We're called to preach that. It is a beautiful history. All Jesus people are called to preach that. But we are also called to preach a promise. The promise that that same Jesus is going to one day return to this earth. He'll end this universe as we know it. He's going to bring in a new universe and he's going to assign every person on earth who has ever lived to their eternal destiny. That eternal destiny is only in one of two places. We will all either have an eternal destiny in heaven or in hell. And so we're at this moment in time where we are caught between eternity past and eternity future. And it's, it's, it's important that we understand that. It's also important that we understand that eternity past has given us a model and it has given us an assignment. That we as Jesus people aren't only required to live the biblical me message with as much purity as we can but that we are also called to deliver a message from one eternity to the next. That we are in essence in a relay where we hand a baton from one eternity to the next. It's like carrying an Olympic torch and it's, it's our duty, it's our responsibility to pass that torch from the past to the future undimmed to the next generation. And I think it's this specific charge to those of us who are already Jesus people that becomes a tension for us because we really just want to live our lives. <laughs> it's easy to live your own life. It's challenging to challenge people. It's difficult to become a squeaky wheel. Can't we all just get along? Can't we just love Everybody, yeah, yeah, we are supposed to love everybody. But love is never meant to be presented as compliance. And so we have a responsibility to live with a boldness, with a, with a faithfulness to preaching the gospel, to spreading this story of Jesus. And as I look through the scriptures, I can't find any other place that better establishes that message in our hearts than this book of Second Timothy, it's why we started with second <laughs> rather than first. It's, it's Paul's final word to the church, to you and to me. It's like his, like his spiritual last will and testament. And throughout its verses, a charge is given over and over to Timothy and through Timothy to us. And that charge is that we are to be bold and faithful in sharing the gospel. So, uh, I want to read the text. I want to read all seven verses, and then I want to come back and do my best to break it down into three sections. I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Paul and Timothy. Uh, then I'm going to try to look at Paul's motivational methodology, which is, in essence, uh, how he got Timothy to receive this charge of continuing in his apostolic, uh, apostolic ministry after his death. And then finally... I want to look at Paul's charge to Timothy that he should fan the spiritual gift into flame. So let's look at the scripture. Uh, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of his life in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from, the, from God the Father and Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day longing to see you even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. I'm mindful of the sincere faith within you which, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice and I'm sure is in you too. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, 
but of power and of love and of self-discipline. Maybe you heard that verse like this. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. What's interesting is in the Greek, the word doesn't say timidity or fear. The word says cowardice. God has not given us a spirit of cowardice. God has not called us. He has not created us. He will not allow us as Jesus' people to live our lives as cowards. I think it's interesting the way that Paul begins this letter. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Now, if, if you've read the works of Paul, you, you may say, well, he started like every letter <laughs> in that way. Why is this interesting? To me, it's interesting because of the audience. He's addressing Timothy, this young guy who's not only become a really good friend, but a guy who he calls his spiritual son. Why would he need to tell his spiritual son that he is an apostle? Well, first, the question that presents itself is what is an apostle? Many of us have heard that. We've heard that word and you hear about, particularly when you talk about Paul. Now, if you come from uh, the Catholic Church, you, you probably didn't hear him referred to as the Apostle Paul. You probably referred to him, heard him referred to as St. Paul. But in the evangelical Protestant Church, we call him the Apostle Paul. It's really his title. What is that? An apostle is someone who's been sent with a mission, with a message, and a sense of authority from the person who has sent them. And in, and in Paul's time, that apostolic authority was bestowed upon people by a committee. And for someone to qualify as a biblical apostle, that person had to have witnessed Jesus' earthly ministry firsthand, including his baptism, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. But Paul asserted, we know, if you know the life of Paul, he didn't see any of those things in the flesh. And so Paul asserts that he was an apostle who was called personally by Jesus for a specific task. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus by the will of God. And over and over throughout his ministry, he kept going back to this fact that he had received his, his apostleship directly from God. Not from men, not by a committee. Nobody voted him in. Nobody could vote him out. And so he hung his hat on this fact that he had a personal encounter with Jesus that changed his life. That's why it's important that we have a personal encounter with Jesus, that we develop a personal relationship with Jesus. Because when you get to heaven someday and they ask you where your ticket is, you don't get to say, my grandmama had it when she got here. You don't get to say, well, my mom was a believer. Because nobody else on earth gets to punch your ticket. You have to have your own passport. And so Paul says, I was personally called. And when he had that personal encounter with Jesus, it changed his life, his direction, and his will. What was Paul's will for Paul? It was to crush the church. It was to disband and destroy this Jesus movement. But what was God's will for Paul? It was that he would build the church, that he would carry the message of Jesus to the farthest regions of the world. And guess what? Paul lost, God won. God's will trumped Paul's will, and it transformed his life. So again, he says, I, Paul, am an apostle by the will of God. In fact, he really emphasizes that point in his opening to his letter to the Galatians. He says, Paul, an apostle not sent from men or by men, but no, I was sent by Jesus and by God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. So he's, he's establishing his authority. Now, here he is writing to his friend and his spiritual son, Timothy. So why, why would he feel the... Like, can I just pause for a second? When Paul wrote this, he didn't know he was writing to you. <laughs> he didn't know that he was writing the Bible. He wasn't on an assignment. There wasn't, you know, 32 guys that got together and sat down over coffee at the exchange and said, you know, we should do it the rest of our lives. We should write a book that lasts forever, that makes people most of the time feel like crap, but sometimes makes people encouraged and makes them feel like they can make it. That's what we're going to do with the rest of our lives. Bro, he was some dude ready to die who wrote a letter to his homie. 
He didn't know that you were going to read this thing. He just thought that his dog was going to read this letter, and he's about to die. And so why in the world? Like if I wrote a letter to my son, I would never say, Dear Isaiah, from your father, the one who gave you life. He'd be like, bro, why are you so stupid? Like, of course, I already know that. I know that because you pay all my bills. I know that you're my dad. And so, like, why would he have to remind this dude who's his son of his position? The reason for it is because he was driving home the weight and the seriousness of this letter. He's saying, Timothy... I know you know who I am. I know you know how I've lived my life. But I want you to keep that in mind because I'm about to give you a really heavy task. And because of the heaviness of that task, he's reestablishing his authority right from the beginning by saying, an apostle hmm, of Jesus. Bet you never read the Bible this slow in your whole life before, have you? You never spent... 16 minutes talking about two sentences. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus. How? According to the promise of life that's in Jesus. And he's passionately communicating that in Jesus, there's a promise of life to those who are dying. There's a promise of life to people like us who are dead in their trespasses, who are dead in their transgressions and in their sins. But people who are outside of Jesus, there is no promise. People who are outside of Jesus are dead men walking. I read an interesting article about a young man who's a star football player uh, at, oh, at the Ohio State University named Harry Miller. And he's a great offensive lineman and he was highly recruited and they were putting all of their hopes in this young man. And he recently retired from football as a college player. And the reason that he retired from football is because he's struggling so deeply with his mental health. He's struggling so deeply with depression and anxiety and suicidal thoughts. And so he went to his head coach and he communicated how he was feeling and said that he couldn't, he couldn't continue to play football at the level that he was playing football. And so, and so he had to retire. And in the article, he said, nobody understood that when they looked at me, I was a dead man walking. And for some of you, you are dead men walking. You are dead women walking. Your marriages are dead. Your finances are dead. Your mental health is dead. Your spirituality is dead. Your hope is dead. But there is a hope. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly. He said, because I live, you will live also. And so Paul's saying that was the purpose of his apostleship. It, it was the mandate, the message that Jesus had given him to carry and to communicate and that he had been faithful with that even to this point where he was on death row sitting in a Roman dungeon writing his last words, cold, alone, deserted, lonely. That's Paul. Now, who's Timothy? Paul calls him his dear son in the faith, literally calls him his beloved child. And for those of us who've read the New Testament, you may not know it, but we've met him before. We've met him in Acts chapter 16. He was a believer in Jesus who had become that way through Paul's ministry. He was converted on Paul's very first missionary journey through the city of Lystra, a trip in which Paul was stoned, not in the way you used to be, but he was stoned and left for dead. And some theologians believe that Paul actually did die and that God raised him from the dead. That could have been Timothy's first glimpse of Paul. What a first impression. A preacher who was raised from the dead, which, which would have been incredibly encouraging. On the flip side, though, he also saw a preacher who needed to be raised from the dead, which could have been incredibly discouraging to a young man who felt a call to preach. Dying is not a great recruiting tool. His mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois, they were Jewish and they were also believers in Jesus, but his father was Greek. He was completely opposed to Jesus. So Paul took Timothy under his wing and he committed to train and disciple him. And we see a beautiful picture of what discipleship is meant to be through their relationship. In fact, a couple chapters later, 
Paul gives this incredible image of how discipleship should look. He says, you, however, know all about my teaching, watch this, and my way of life. Paul not only committed to teaching Timothy what to live by teaching in the scriptures, he also taught him how to live by showing him those scriptures in action. That's true discipleship, what to do and how to do it. I wonder, do you have any spiritual sons or spiritual daughters? Now, Timothy had some strengths and he also had some weaknesses. Probably his greatest strength was his sincere, genuine faith in Jesus, which he poured out into a life of faithful service. Paul talks about that in Philippians chapter 2. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone else looks out for their own interests, but not those of Jesus. But y'all know Timothy. He's proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served faithfully with me in the work of the gospel. I mean, talk about high words of praise. He says, Timothy doesn't look out for himself or for his own interests. He's more interested in Jesus' interests. He's more interested in building the kingdom. That's his heart. It's Timothy's greatest strength. But again, he also has some weaknesses. Let me give you three. Uh, first was his youth. He was young. He was inexperienced, which, which could have caused a lot of people to think that he wasn't ready to take on the responsibility that Paul was putting on him here in this letter. And so Paul says to him, bro, don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. You're fine. Secondly, is Timothy was sickly. Homie was sick all the time. Y'all know any hypochondriacs, people that sick all the time, people that live on WebMD? <laughs> Man, if you're sick, don't go on WebMD because the minute you go on WebMD, you're like, dang, I'm finna die. Like, that's, you're always going to die on WebMD. I'm just telling you, if you got a little tickle in your throat, it's probably esophageal cancer. I'm just saying, it's exactly <laughs> WebMD, it's like WebMD wants, it's like they get paid to make people scared. And so he was sick though. Dude was sick all the time. He had all sorts of troubles. The biggest of which is that he had some sort of stomach issue. He had a weak stomach. I don't know if it was like intestinal or what it was, but he was sickly. But probably his greatest weakness was that he was timid. He was naturally shy, naturally soft-spoken, particularly in groups. <laughs> But Paul constantly challenges him throughout this letter to work through that, to get over it, to preach with boldness, to stand up and be counted. He couldn't be a leader if he didn't do that. So you have the author, Paul, and you have the audience, Timothy. But what was Paul, the author's motivational methodology to the audience, Timothy? How did he prepare him to receive the weight that was going to be laid upon him? I see four ways. Uh, first, through constant prayer. Constant, thankful prayer. Paul tells him, I thank God as night and day. I constantly remember you in my prayers. Now, again, picture Paul. He's sitting in a dark, damp, depressing dungeon. He's just had this small circular opening opened above his head, letting in air and the little bit of light that he's using to be able to see and to be able to write these words. And at this point in Paul's life, he knows he is about to die. I mean, he even says, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering and the time has come for my departure. And so as he's writing these words, he knows that he's going to die. And in these moments, he could have started looking inward. He could have started feeling sorry for himself. He could have started living in his own misery. Woe is me. I may as well go eat dirt and die. Instead, he gives us a pattern of joy and contentment. An example of how to behave in a situation when their situation and circumstances stink. He commits to constant prayer. It actually reminds me of a guy here in Green Bay. His name's Bill Magoon. I mean, he's not in prison. He's not on his deathbed. He's retired, but I think he likes it. Every once in a while, though, Bill will call me or he'll send me a message that's simply letting me know that he's praying for me. And, and he does that for like tons of pastors here in Green Bay. And I can't think of many people's calls that encourage me more than Bill's. That was Paul. In some way, he's receiving this inward therapy through his outward focus. But in a way, he's also preparing Timothy. He's saying, Timothy, I want you to know I'm always praying for you. I wonder, who are you constantly praying for? Hmm. 
Here's the second way he's preparing Timothy is through his personal example. Again, this is part of Paul's pattern of discipleship. He, he lived out his faith in front of Timothy. Who are you living out your faith in front of? And so he's saying, because, because I thank God night and day like our forefathers did, I have a clear conscience. Do you have a clear conscience? See, some of you don't read the book because the book offends you. Some of you don't read the book because it reveals things to you about you. <laughs> some of you don't read the book because you've got a cloudy conscience. I don't want to just be forgiven. Like, I'm forgiven. There is zero doubt on earth. That I am not going to, I, I am going to heaven 100%. If you're going to bet on one thing, bet on the fact, put it, I'm going to heaven. But I don't want to just go to, like, I don't want to just be forgiven. I don't want to spend the rest of my life serving Jesus in between sins. I want to transcend those sins. I want to live my life with a clear conscience. And Paul gives a beautiful image of that at the end of this letter. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He's saying, I stayed at my post until the job was done. My conscience, it's clear. And he's challenging Timothy to live his life in the same way. He's saying, Timothy, I'm not asking you to do anything that I haven't done. I'm asking you to follow me as I follow Jesus. Keep a clear conscience. Be ready. Here's a third way he prepared Timothy is by cultivating deep relationships. He says, recalling your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. That's just poetic. You can love Shakespeare, whatever. That's dope right there. He said, recall it. That's sick. If you are bored reading the Bible, you are reading the wrong Bible. Because here's what he's saying, bro. Remember when we like had to leave each other? And you was crying. Like, ah. He's kind of busting on him a little. This is funny to me. He's kind of, hey, bro, remember? Remember you was crying? He's like, hey, hey, bro, don't leave. Like, yeah, I still got a little of your snot on my shoulder. But <laughs> recalling your tears. Any parent who's ever had a kid leave for college, I already know. My kids are both leaving for college in the fall. I'm already practicing crying on their bed. I'm just telling you, sometimes when they're at school, in high school, and it's going in the room and I just cry. I'm getting the, bed, the, getting the pillow warmed up for the tears. I'm just saying. And Paul said, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Mm, that's a lesson in how to treat each other. Uh, like, I think we have to be open and honest with each other. Yeah, we do have to confront each other if we see each other in sin. That's love. We do have to challenge each other to be faithful in what we say and in what we do. But before any of those challenges or confrontations happen, there has to be a sense that the person confronting or challenging us really loves us. My pastor used to say, you could say anything you want to people as long as you say it in love. And Paul did that. He poured his life into Timothy. So Timothy knew, yes, there are some serious, heavy requests coming my way. But this guy who's asking me to do that, he really loves me and he has my best interests at heart. Here's the fourth way that he's preparing Timothy is through constant encouragement. Hmm. Uh, when Paul started out, he was a bit of a... Uh, he was a jerk. Like, let's just be honest. He's trying to kill people. And so I don't think Paul was a natural edifier. I'm not a natural complimenter. I don't, I think nice things about people, but I, it, never, it seldom makes it from my brain to my mouth. I, I think the longer that Paul fulfilled his mission, though, the more he looked for things that he could recognize in people to bring them encouragement. And he does that with Timothy here. He says, I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And we'll talk about them later. We're not going to do that today. When we get to chapter 3, we'll talk about them. But what I will say is that their faith was legendary. And Paul says, I'm persuaded, Timothy, that that same faith lives in you. And Timothy fully understood that from Paul 
he couldn't have gotten a higher compliment. Paul was speaking life over him. He was saying, bro, I know you're shy. I know you're young. I know you're sick. But your faith? Come on, man. That ain't no joke. Your faith is real. It is sincere. You, Timothy, are a true believer. And that's why Paul chose him to carry out his mission, to carry out his mandate, which is like a really heavy load. So he says up front, listen, my son, this is going to be hard, but I know you can do it because you are the real deal. And once that groundwork of faith had been laid down in Timothy, Paul delivers his first charge to him. He says that he should fan his gift into flame. He says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you throughout the laying of my hands. What is the gift of God? It is Timothy's spiritual gift. A special spiritual gift that Jesus had given him upon conversion. And we all have one of those gifts. God gives them to every one of us when we receive him as our Savior. If you look back at 1 Timothy, there's a passage that refers to Timothy's. Paul tells him, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to the preaching and to the teaching. Don't neglect your gift which was given to you through a prophetic Message. And I don't know what that prophetic message was, but I do know that when he got that message, he also was given a spiritual gift. And that gift was the gift of preaching and of teaching the word. So here in his epilogue, Paul says, Timothy, you should fan that gift into flame. And he's telling us the same. The fact is, every one of you, if you are a Jesus person, you have a spiritual gift, a supernatural ability given to you by God to fulfill his calling on your life. It isn't natural. It's not a natural ability. That's a talent. A spiritual gift is a spiritual ability that Ephesians 4 says is for the purpose of building up his body into maturity. And there are a bunch of different spiritual gifts. Wisdom, knowledge, faith, teaching, healing, prophecy, miracles. They're supernatural gifts. And you all have at least one. And it doesn't belong to you. It's only yours temporarily. When you die, you're going to have to give it back because you're not going to need any of those gifts when you get to heaven. But when you get there, God's going to ask you what you did with it. What are you doing with yours? Well, maybe you're not doing anything with yours because you don't actually know what yours is. So the question is, how do you discover them? Well, for years we've had everybody who's gone through our class growth track take a test and that would reveal to them what their spiritual gifts are. And so if you haven't taken your spiritual gifts test, there's a QR code that we're going to put up on the screen and that'll take you to it. And I want you to scan that and I want you to take some time to figure out what your spiritual gifts are. Because listen, it's going to shock you. I took my spiritual gifts test, I was like, the devil is a liar. Are you kidding me? Did you know that being a pastor is number seven? <laughs> On my list made me want to go get a job at 7-Eleven. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Faith was number 14. Those are the two things that I've spent my whole life doing. You know what was like the top ones I didn't even think about? One of the top ones was that I'm prophetic. I didn't even know that. I didn't know that I was prophetic. I didn't know that I could like pick stuff out. I should start playing the lotto. That's what I feel like God told me in my spiritual gifts test. I should say, no, I'm just kidding. But you'll be surprised at, at what they are. Here's what I do know. Can you imagine what kind of impact we could have on our city if we all started using ours? And so Paul's telling Timothy and ultimately us to be vigilant in developing those gifts, to fan them into flame because a life spent pursuing Jesus is hard. And we need each other. You need my gifts, and I need yours. We need each other's gifts to survive and to thrive. And I want my life to be an example of that. I want God to wring out every little drop of the gifts that he's given me. Like Paul, I want my life to be poured out like a drink offering. And I ultimately want you to want the same thing too. And so I beseech you, my sons and daughters in the faith, Fan the gift into flame. Will you do that today? Would you close your eyes? Fan the gift into flame. Before you can have a spiritual gift, you have to have a spiritual encounter. You have to have an encounter with Jesus like the apostle or Saint Paul had where he changed direction in his life where the things that he had been doing were no longer working and so it, he turned course. I wonder if you're here today and you haven't had an encounter 
with Jesus. There's lots of ways that we talk about that in the church. We talk about it as salvation, uh, giving your life to Jesus, giving your heart to Jesus, entering into a personal relationship with Jesus. But simply what it is, is just you give up, you surrender. I did that 27 years ago and my life has never been the same. It wasn't easy and my life hasn't been easy since. But what I know is that I would have never had the gifts that God has given me, the family God has given me, the marriage God has given me, the kids that God has given me, the hope that God has given me, the eternity that God has given me if I didn't just surrender first. So I wonder if you're here and you say, Sean, I haven't surrendered my life to Jesus, but I want to before I leave this place. The Bible says to do that, you have to do two things. You have to confess and you have to profess. Confess that you're a sinner and profess that you believe that Jesus can change that. So I want to give you the opportunity to do both of those things today in just a moment, and here's how. In just a moment, I'm going to ask for people who want to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior to do two things. First is with nobody looking around, I'm going to ask for people to raise their hand and make eye contact with me. Once you've done that as your act of confession, once we've made eye contact, you can put your hand down. Secondly, in your act of profession, I'm going to ask you to repeat a prayer after me. I'm going to say a few lines. I'm going to pause. And then if you repeat those words and you mean them in your heart, the Bible says that you will be saved. So if you're here today and you say, Sean, I don't have a relationship with Jesus, but I'd like to. With nobody looking around, I'm going to ask you to just raise your hand and make eye contact with me. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I'm going to ask everybody in here to say these words after me. Jesus, I have sin in my life, but I don't want to anymore. Please forgive me. Come into my life and change me. Make me different. Make me new. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I wonder if you're in here and you say, Sean, like I'm a Jesus guy. I'm a Jesus girl. I took those steps previously in my life. I've gotten the first gift, which is the gift of salvation, but I either want to know what my spiritual gifts are or I haven't been fanning those gifts into flame. And I want you to pray for me today that I will do that. If you want to fan the gifts to flame, I want you to just raise your hand with nobody looking around. Yes, yes. Let's go, Jesus. We love you. Thank you for my friends who are in this place. God, I pray peace over them. I pray power into their lives that, God, as we fan into flame those spiritual gifts, you'll not only change their lives, their relationships, their homes, but that you'll change this church and this city. In Jesus' name, amen.